Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rom. And I'm Erin Viner. In our top story, Washington announced that it was cutting more than $200 million in aid to the Palestinian Authority and Gaza from the budget that was approved by Congress earlier this year. A State Department spokeswoman said the aid money does not provide value to American taxpayers. The Arab leadership in Ramallah has become increasingly hostile towards the United States. PA President Mahmoud Abbas has been openly antagonistic and called for the severing of contact with the Trump administration after America's recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. PLO Secretary General Saeb Arakat accused the U.S. and Israel of waging war against the Palestinians through financial pressure. And another PLO Executive Committee member, Wassel Abu Yosef, charged President Trump with trying to blackmail the PA by not handing over the $200 million. Abbas also vowed to continue the pay-to-slay system of using foreign aid to pay salaries to Arab terrorists in Israeli jails in open defiance of U.S. pressure. In a televised address, the Fatah leader said that financial support of so-called Muslim martyrs and heroes began in 1965 and will never stop, even if only pennies are left in the budget. He went on to boast that the PA is proud and not ashamed of the policy. Documents show that just between 2013 and 2017, $1.4 billion of blood money was paid to the terrorists and their families. The U.S. Congress finally refused to contribute to this travesty and recently passed the Taylor Force Act to cut $300 million of American aid until Ramallah discontinues the program. The European Union, however, remains Ramallah's biggest donor and continues to donate around $755 million a year. The State of Israel salutes John McCain. Those words from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu as he expressed deep sadness over the passing of the U.S. Senator. Netanyahu received word of McCain's death while on a state visit to Lithuania. He hailed the former Republican presidential candidate and Vietnam War hero as a great friend and defender of Israel. The premier said he will always treasure the constant friendship the Arizona lawmaker showed to the people of Israel and to him personally. Netanyahu remembered McCain as a great American patriot whose support for Israel never wavered because it sprang from his belief in democracy and freedom. During his historic trip to Vilnius, Benjamin Netanyahu became the first Israeli premier to attend the summit of the Baltic states, reflecting his nation's growing stature around the world. He thanked Lithuania for the strong position it has taken in EU forums on behalf of truth, on behalf of Israel, and on behalf of decency. The Israeli leader also attended a ceremony in remembrance of the 200,000 Lithuanian Jews who perished in the Holocaust. He spoke of his ancestral ties to the country, including the time anti-Semitic thugs nearly beat his grandfather to death there over a century ago. Netanyahu recounted that before losing consciousness, his grandfather vowed that if he lived, he would take his family to the land of Israel to rebuild their lives in the tradition of the brave Maccabees. In poignant words addressed to his late grandfather, Netanyahu said, Today I have returned to this forest of death as the Prime Minister of Israel. The Jewish people now have a state and an army, and they will never again be defenseless. Israel is proud. Israel is forever. Am Israel Chai. The people of Israel live. The head of the Palestinian Football Association has been barred from all soccer-related activity for a year on charges that he incited hatred and violence. Jabril Rajoub was also slapped with a $20,000 fine by the disciplinary board of FIFA International Football Federation. Back in June, Rajoub urged Palestinians to personally target Argentinian superstar Lionel Messi by burning pictures and jerseys bearing his name ahead of a World Cup warm-up game against Israel slated to be held in Jerusalem. Buenos Aires ultimately canceled the match after its national team members said they felt totally attacked and violated upon seeing their shirts stained with blood-red paint in the aftermath of Rajoub's rant. The 65-year-old Arab sports chief is a convicted terrorist who also serves as the head of Ramallah's Olympic Committee. 750 Jews were the victims of an attempted Arab car ramming and firebomb attack as they tried to make their way on a coordinated visit to the biblical tomb of Joseph in the Sumerian city of Shechem. An IDF force escorting the worshippers opened fire at the Muslim terrorists in a vehicle that was speeding toward the group. Several of the assailants were reportedly injured. 
That same night, eight suspected terrorists were arrested in Judea and Samaria on charges of violence against Israeli civilians and security personnel. Multiple illegal weapons and rounds of ammunition were also seized during the counterterrorism operations. A Palestinian nurse who worked for the Doctors Without Borders aid group put down his medical kit, picked up a rifle, and opened fire at Israeli troops near the Gaza border. The terrorist also threw an explosive device before being neutralized by the soldiers. IDF Major General Camille Abu Rokon, who heads the defense ministry body that coordinates government activities with the Palestinians, commented that he who takes part in saving lives should assist in humanitarian activities in the Gaza Strip and should not engage in terrorism. Following the triumphant relocation of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, Israel is also hoping that its sovereignty over the Golan Heights will officially be recognized by Washington. This according to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who commented that he would never relinquish such a mission. Israel captured the western two-thirds of the Golan from Syria in the 1967 Six-Day War and legally annexed the territory in 1981. The issue re-arose during the recent visit by U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton's visit when he said that while the White House understands Israel's claim, there is no change in the position for now. Syria is building up its ground forces beyond its pre-Civil War size, suggesting that President Bashar al-Assad's army has recovered from a critically high rate of defections witnessed after the conflict erupted in 2011. This observation was made by Israel Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman during an inspection of the frontier between the two countries. Israel closely monitors military capacity in the Arab Republic, against which it has fought three wars. Assad now holds most of Syria after recapturing the area bordering the Israeli side of the Golan Heights in July. The resurgence of military strength is being attributed to vital support provided to the brutal Assad regime by its Hezbollah, Iranian and Russian allies. A bishop for the Episcopal Diocese of Massachusetts was forced to apologize after concocting appalling claims against Israel. Last month, Gail Harris told the general convention of her church that while visiting Jerusalem, two atrocities were committed by IDF soldiers against Palestinian children. After being caught out on her lies by two advocacy groups, Harris then admitted that she was at fault and had been ill-advised to repeat unverified stories from others. The diocese's top bishop, Alan M. Gates, affirmed his second-in-command's apology. He added that, We recognize that for Christian leaders to relate unsubstantiated accounts of Israeli violence awakens traumatic memory of a deep history of inciting hostility and violence against Jews, a history the echoes of which are heard alarmingly in our own day. Israel is looking to auction off the rights to mine the Dead Sea years earlier than scheduled in a bid to maintain one of the country's biggest businesses without worsening an environmental tragedy. The Dead Sea's mineral-rich waters are today harvested by the Israel Chemicals Company, which has held the tender for nearly 70 years. The concession is set to expire in the year 2030, but the government wants to act now, perhaps as early as 2022, to offset any downfall in sales. The resources are used to make fertilizers, flame retardants, and other products sold for billions of dollars worldwide. The new license will also balance profits with environmental interests for the first time. For example, it will set limits on how much water can be pumped from the sea to hopefully slow down current evaporation levels of more than three feet a year. A young Israeli just set a new world record at the Rhythmic Gymnastics World Challenge Cup in Minsk, Belarus. 19-year-old Linoy Ashram scored 20.65 for her club's demonstration, breaking the record that was just set at the European Championships earlier this year. Linoy made history again by winning the gold with her final 77.88 score in the all-around phase of the event. That made her the first person in the competition's history to ever capture two gold medals in one season following her previous victory this past May in Spain. The entire nation is now supporting the athlete's dream to represent Israel at the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo. Being sick while you're abroad does not just spoil the trip, but it can also be dangerous. An Israeli startup called Air Doctor Limited wants to help and has created a platform so tourists in Europe or the Americas can book appointments with pre-vetted local pediatricians, general physicians, and other health care providers. The app also allows users to select medical professionals based on what languages they speak. 
The Israeli company just raised $3.1 million from a Paris, London and Tel Aviv based InsureTech incubator, which is a subsidiary of a French insurance focused holding company. Air Doctor was founded two years ago and employs 12 people in the Moza elite community outside of Jerusalem. The Bible Lands Museum in Jerusalem announced its decision to loan Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu a 2,600-year-old clay tablet that bears his name. Benayahu ben Netanyahu was etched in one of the world's earliest scripts known as cuneiform writing during the Babylonian exile in the year 511 before the Common Era after the destruction of the First Temple. It's part of a collection of 110 other tablets that archaeologists say provides the earliest written evidence of the biblical exile of the Judeans in what is now southern Iraq. The tablet will be proudly displayed in the Prime Minister's office for the coming year, among other ancient artifacts shown to visiting dignitaries to visibly demonstrate the millennia-long history of the Jewish people in the state of Israel. That concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here in a beautiful sunny day on our rooftop studio in Jerusalem. My guest today is Benjor Yamini. He's the author of Industry of Lies. Benjor, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for hosting me. Before we get into the book, which is uh, unbelievable, let's talk about you for a second. You're one of the most celebrated columnists here in Israel. You've had a many decade long journalism career. Tell us about your career. Okay, first of all, for many years I was a lawyer. Uh, in the last uh, 17 years I'm working uh, as a journalist, full-time job, uh, scholar, researcher. I'm also teaching uh, in university. And um, for many years I was even a peace activist. I mean, I met the Yasser Arafat, the leader of Palestinians, uh, many years ago, before the Oslo Accords. Uh, I met him in uh, Tunisia, and I met uh, all the other high-rank Palestinians, uh, including Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen, and others, and some of them became my friends. And I was participating in many uh, Israeli-Palestinian meetings. I began to be suspicious when I heard so many lies about the conflict, so many lies about Israel. And that's what actually pushed me uh, to write this book, which I call now Industry of Lies. That's what's so fascinating about the book. You're seen as someone who comes from the left. You've been involved in a lot of the, the peace camp, as they called it. Yet the, the book is actually pretty factual and a scathing indignation of what's happening here, where there's just so much lies in the media, in the academia. Why did you decide to write this book? Yeah, that's, that's what uh, is very interesting, because I'm uh, not political. This book is non-political. I write about the two main bodies of information, namely media and academia. And I'm showing how they are lying. I'm not showing about the political bias. I don't care about it. I mean, each person, each professor, each journalist is allowed to his own views. But I don't think people are allowed to their own facts. And when they lie, it should be exposed. And that's what I'm actually doing in my book. I'm showing what they say. I'm showing what professors and journalists write and say. And I'm showing that they are lying. I'm not speaking about their political views. I don't mind about it. My big question I always get is why? Why are they lying? Uh, why they are they lying? Because it became a kind of trend. I mean, Israel is a kind of a colonialist uh, uh, country. It's because of the post-colonial uh, school of thought, which took over so many universities in the United States and globally. And, and there are so many reasons. I'm not dealing that much with the reasons why they are lying about Israel more than about any other issue. You know, now we all speak about fake news uh, and, and about alternative facts. S excuse me, but it began so many years before. I mean, when, I'll give you an example if you will allow me. When a professor write an article, the head of MESA, Middle East Studies Association, about the 9-11, terror attack. And when he writes that uh, the commission, the Congress, the official commission of the Congress wrote in the report that actually they thought about it because of the Janine massacre that Israel uh, uh, 
uh, that Israel uh, uh, conducted in Jenin. When actually, and he wrote it in an article, and actually the allegedly massacre in Jenin was seven uh, months after the 9-11. I mean, a total lie. It was never written in the report, but he wrote it. He is a scholar, he is a president of Mesa. And, and so many other examples of that kind, how they lie again and again. Why they do it? It's because of this school of thought that, that is actually occupying uh, so many parts of the media and the academia nowadays. I think one of the biggest threats that we're seeing in academia is revisionist history. I think people are not just lying, but they're rewriting the history of the state of Israel. Uh, do you speak about those issues in your book? Yes, I do. I'll, I'll, let's talk about, for example, the Nakba, I guess, the Palestinian catastrophe, what happened to them in 48 when Israel uh, fought them out and so on. When let me tell you something, there was a war. They declared, not Israel, the Palestinians, the Arabs, they declared a war of extermination. They were totally against the UN resolution about partition. Now, they suffered out of it. But when you zoom out, when you zoom out, you find out that in that time, speaking about the 40s and before the 40s, it was the norm in every conflict there was a kind of a population exchange. People were forced out. My family was forced out from Yemen. So many Jews from Arab countries were forced out from the uh, uh, Arab states. How come that they complain? I mean, 52 million people were forced out of their homelands in order to establish new nation states. It happened in every corner in the world. But out of all the 52 million people that became refugees in that time, no one is a refugee now, except one community that emerged from uh, 700,000 to more than 5 million people. This is the biggest manipulation of this time. But isn't the industry of lies actually being perpetuated by the Palestinian Authority? I mean, we're seeing this with the BDS movement. We're seeing this with all these uh, anti-Israel movements. It's, it's, it's actually being pushed by them. It's not that they're victims of these lies. They actually are the ones who are spreading them. It's, it's a very uh, important uh, uh, question because actually, uh, yes, they initiated the whole story. But, but the industry of lies, I'm not blaming the Palestinians. I'm not, I'm not blaming the Arabs. I'm blaming the, the most important people from the media and from the academia. When they blame Israel, when they perpetuate the story of Nakba, when they lie about what Israel is doing. For example, Israel is uh, retaliating in a very disproportionate way. It's a lie because when you compare, which I did because my book is full of comparative studies, when you compare between what Israel did in, in Gaza or in, in the territories or uh, Judea and Samaria and uh, uh, to what uh, Britain did in uh, Iraq or Afghanistan or what the United States did, you find out that Israel actually uh, harmed much less innocent civilians absolutely and proportionally comparing to any other battlefield. But people don't know it. People again and again blame Israel that Israel is committing crimes against humanity and, and so on. They have no idea what they're talking about. Look at the numbers. The numbers that were, that were published even by Palestinians and you will find out the truth. People are not looking for the truth, people are looking for propaganda. And there are, there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for a viewing audience? Um, I want you people, uh, uh, those who are looking at us now, I want you to know the facts, in order to know the facts. Not, I, I don't care about your political views. I want you to read this book just because of one thing. I want people to know, to be informed, because now we are under a campaign of disinformation, disinformation and ill information. We have to fight it. We have to fight it in order to achieve peace. Thank you, Bandrov, for being on the show, and thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, now back to the studio. Up next, the return to Zion with Karen Hayasod.
Shalom and welcome to the Return to Zion with Karen Hayesod. I'm Eliezer Moody Sandberg, World Chairman of Karen Hayesod, the leading official fundraising organization for the State of Israel. This week, we will learn about the righteous among the Gentiles. Throughout Israel's modern history, many Christians have risked their lives and the lives of their families to defend the Jewish people and God's covenant with Israel. As the Nazis ruthlessly set about their demonic plan to eradicate the Jewish people, Europe became an accomplice to humanity's darkest hour. While the Nazi gas chambers and killing fields extinguished the lives of six million Jews, Europeans overwhelmingly turned a blind eye to the horror unfolding, or worse, became accessories to genocide. God's compassion appeared to have abandoned Europe, an entire continent devoid of humanity, Yet a handful of people refuse to forget the Bible's teaching in Genesis 1.27. God created man in his own image. Unimaginably risking their own lives, these people demonstrated that even in Europe's sea of darkness, human kindness and mercy can shine through. Seeking nothing in return, these Christians jeopardized everything in order to save Jews from facing certain death. Often hiding entire Jewish families for months, sometimes years, they lived in constant fear of discovery and cruel retribution at the hands of the Nazis. Et quand moi j'allais pleurer, si je puis dire, pour qu'on prenne les enfants, et quand je racontais ce qui s'y passait, que on arrachait les, les, les gens de leur maison, euh, on, on lançait leurs vêtements par la cage d'escalier, on les emmenait par camion à Malines. In appreciation of their remarkable deeds, these angels on earth have been honored by Israel as the righteous among the nations. Exactly how many Jewish lives were saved by these brave individuals, we don't know. But they joined the hundreds of thousands of Holocaust survivors that Karen Hayesod supporters helped extricate from Europe's inferno to reach Israel. They came from 51 countries, from all churches, from all walks of life, from remote farms, city slums, universities, high society, and beyond. They were bound by just one thing, the determination to preserve humanity in the face of all evil. Some of their stories are well known, the likes of Oskar Schindler and Raoul Wallenberg, but lesser known heroes too, such as Adolf Althoff, Father Hubert Salis, and Leopold Socha, showed the same unimaginable courage all carried a bright torch of humanity in a Europe enveloped by moral darkness. Avraham Savion was just nine years old when the war broke out. At the age of 12, he was taken in by a Christian family who risked their lives and the lives of their children to save this one Jewish boy. When word got out that they were hiding a Jew, they arranged for Avraham to be taken in by a church where other Jewish boys were hiding out as well. There, they provided for his every need until he was reunited with his relatives. Jean de Ligne was a Nassik in Belgium, and he was saved from the death of the Holy Spirit. After that, I went to a few places. I met him the first time in a church, in a church. It was a private church of his, that he decided to take me away. ולשים אותו נער, נער כנסייה, בוא תאמר. אני עוזר, הולך אחרי הכומר, מחזיק לו את הגלימה, מחזיק לו את הנר, או דברים כאלה. משרת אותו בזמן שהוא עורך את התפילה. חסידי אומות העולם הצילו אותנו. אלו, והנזירות, והמורות, וכולם הצילו אותי במיוחד. הגעתי למקום מנוחה. אחרי מרדפים שנרדפתי כל הזמן. הם החיו אותנו, נתנו לנו חיים חדשים. The righteous among the nations helped fulfill the divine wish to restore the people of Israel to their land. The descendants of those saved today number in the millions, building their lives in the Jewish state with the help of Karen Hayesod. Today, 
70 years after the Holocaust, too many Jews still remain in distress and danger in perilous corners of the globe. Now is our opportunity to continue the legacy of the righteous among the nations by assisting in the rescue of these Jews to make a new life in the land of their forefathers. Let's bless Israel together. To donate and get information, call us at 1-800-505-1665 or visit our website at www.khisrael.org. The removal by the State Department of the word occupied in referring to Judea and Samaria, the territories liberated by Israel in the 1967 war, often referred to in the world as the West Bank, is an event of great diplomatic, legal, and spiritual significance. Diplomatically, it goes back to the 1947 Partition Resolution and the creation of the State of Israel on May 14, 1948. The Arabs rejected the Partition Resolution, and the Arab state that was to have come into being in what was then known as the West Bank uh, was prohibited from actually emerging. And so, under international law, and even as international law was interpreted by the Johnson administration in 1967, those territories could not be occupied because they never belonged to a sovereign state. Jordan, which unilaterally annexed those areas between 1948 and 1967. That annexation was never deemed uh, legal by any countries in the world other than by Great Britain and Pakistan. So Israel never occupied anything in Judea and Samaria in the West Bank. Now that's an important point as the world condemns Israel for illegal building in that area, for an occupation. None of that, none of those charges have basis in diplomacy, or in legality. Spiritually, perhaps even more significantly, if you look in the Bible, Haifa is not in the Bible, Tel Aviv is not in the Bible, but the cities in Judea and Samaria are emphatically well in the Bible. They are Hebron, Bethlehem, Jericho, and of course Jerusalem. These are the cradles of Jewish civilization. These are the tribal land of the Jewish people. No Jewish person can be called to be said to be occupied his or her own homeland and no Jewish state so constituted can tell a Jew that he or she cannot live in their ancestral homeland. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rom. And I'm Erin Viner reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us again next week for all of your Israel updates.